Okay, we're going to be reading uh, from the book of Revelation, chapter 4 and verse 6, and we're going to read into chapter 5, right to the end of chapter 5. So beginning in Revelation 4 and verse 6, it says this, and before the throne, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was, and is, and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders uh, saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed uh, to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. The four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. And again, God always does bless uh, the reading of his precious word to us. So we last time we we kind of didn't get to do the four living creatures. Uh, we we just got up to verse six, and uh, there we're introduced to these four beasts. Uh, it really does literally in the the Greek it has the idea of living beasts or living animals or living creatures. Uh, so you can see why they use the term beasts. Uh, but basically, uh, the four living creatures. Uh, and it tells us about them, that they're full of eyes before and behind. And then it gives us a description. First was like a lion, second, a calf, third, a face of a man, fourth beast was like a flying eagle. So I want to just think about these, these four living creatures. 
And again, just like the one that sits on the throne, if you remember, we, we saw uh, because of the, uh, the the jewels that were described, you know, the jasper, jasper, the sardine stone, we were taken back to the high priest garments and we saw, behold, the son, son of my right hand. And so the one that sits on the throne, uh, you would get a resemblance of the son of God. Uh, because when the son was on earth, he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. So you've got that resemblance. Now we're going to see these four living creatures. And again, they also give us a, a glimpse of the son of God. And it just seems like, just like in the Old Testament, the tabernacle, which was made on a pattern of heavenly things, everything about it was designed to teach or show or illustrate something about the Lord Jesus. And so it just seems like everything in heaven will remind us of him. And so these four living creatures, it's been well stated. And this goes back even to the early church fathers. This has been a long held view that these uh, the four faces of these four living creatures show us the four views of Christ that are seen in the four gospels. And it's not really stretching it. It's very easy to see. And so if you notice, it says the first beast, verse 7, was like a lion. And of course, when we think of lion, uh, we're caused to think about the, the king, because the lion is the king of the beasts. And uh, everybody acknowledges that, the king of the beasts. And so uh, we're reminded of the Gospel of Matthew, which presents to us, behold your king. And there's an emphasis, uh, as we think of the Lord Jesus, where there's an emphasis of his majesty, of his strength, of his dignity. There's something dignified about a lion. And so, again, we see all of those things portrayed to us in this first of the four living creatures that it would remind us of the gospel by Matthew, behold your king. And then it says the second beast, like a calf or an ox. Uh, and again, we have uh, the gospel of Mark, behold the servant, and the emphasis is on patient, untiring service, uh, like the ox. The ox was the John D. attractor of the ancient world. And again, if you didn't have an ox, of course, the crib was clean, uh, but you didn't get much productivity. Uh, but the ox uh, was very useful. And so we think again of the, uh, the servant, the perfect servant. Uh, we think of him, patient, untiring service like an ox, and dependability. Oh, how wonderful it is to have a savior who is dependable, trustworthy. And so again, that emphasizes uh, the calf. And then of course, the man that would take us to the gospel by Luke, behold the man, emphasis on intelligence and wisdom. And of course, emphasis particularly on, on rule. Uh, it was always God's intent uh, that man should reign on the earth. Dominion was given to him. And again, I just want to focus on that because this is really important as we look at this chapter to recognize that part of what's going on here when the whole question of who is worthy is is brought up it's the question is really this who is worthy to rule and reign on planet earth that's the big question and we'll explain why in a moment but let's just look at a few scriptures about the idea that it was always god's intent for man to reign on the earth and so just a few of them, look at Psalm 8, <clears throat> Psalm 8, verse 6. <clears throat> it says, speaking of, of man, of course, the big question in this is, what is man that you're mindful of in verse 4? And then it says in verse 6, thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands, thou hast put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen, yea, the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, the fish of the sea, whatsoever passeth through the paths of the sea. O oh Lord, O oh Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. So man has, is the one who has been given the role of dominion. Uh, back in Genesis <clears throat> chapter 1, in verse 26, Genesis 1, verse 26, where <clears throat> we read these, these words, um, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air, over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. 
And then in the New Testament, just to show that this carries through, this is, uh, this is not just Old Testament ideas, but it carries through to the new. Hebrews chapter 2, uh, Hebrews is a marvelous book. Chapter 1 emphasizes the divinity of Christ, that he was indeed a divine person. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. And so we have his absolute deity. Let all the angels of God worship him. But when we get to chapter 2, <clears throat> excuse me, we get a look at his uh, humanity. And again, we see in, in Hebrews 2, verse 8, that was put all things in subjection under his feet, or in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. And again, <clears throat> the thought is that he will be the one that have, will have di dominion. And again, we see that, I really began reading too soon, in verse 6 and 7, uh, where he quotes from Psalm 8, uh, and verse 7 says, Thou madest him a little lower than the angels, crowned him with glory and honor, and did set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. So <clears throat> the idea of dominion being given clearly to man and so the, seeing uh, this living creature uh, that resembles a man <clears throat> and then the final one is the eagle and again we get this idea of the gospel by john and the reason we say that is because the eagle uh, is <clears throat> once again um, <clears throat> the uh, as far as the birds are concerned uh, it is the top of the tree in terms of the uh, <clears throat> given that place of highest honor in the birds and uh, again soaring in the heavenlies and the thought is behold your god the one who is the lord from heaven who came down and his sovereignty <clears throat> his supremacy his far-sightedness his rapidity all of these thoughts are brought to us and of course it's interesting isn't it how uh, the eagle is often used um, as uh, a kind of a standard bearer <clears throat> in various nations uh, Nazi Germany had the eagle the United States has the eagle and it's kind of like saying we're the top um, <clears throat> it's amazing pity about Canada and the beaver it just somehow doesn't fit does it uh, it's kind of hardly the most fierce animal you could ever imagine uh, but nevertheless <clears throat> you get that picture of uh, one who sovereignty uh, supremacy uh, conveyed by the eagle so we have these four living creatures now notice their activity uh, it says in verse eight, the four beasts had each of them six wings about him. They were full of eyes within and they rest not day and night saying, holy, 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 Lord God almighty, which was, which is, which is to come. And so <clears throat> their whole purpose, it seems, is to give constant glory to the one who sits on the throne. They proclaim God's holiness day and night without resting over and over again and you get this idea uh, of the the noise of it heaven is is not a quiet place god's holiness is being proclaimed by these living creatures and some believe that their job is to to guard the presence the divine presence as well as proclaim his holiness but to guard his presence and the thinking is if you remember in the garden of eden when man was banished from the garden, that there were cherubim that was set with the shining uh, or the, the fiery sword to prevent access to the presence of God. Anybody tried to come in, they would have to face the cherubim. So they're, they're not only proclaiming his holiness, but they're also defending his holiness. They're there around the throne, resting not day and night, proclaiming the holiness of the one that sits there. Now, they're, they're very similar in their description to the description given in Ezekiel. And if we look back to the book of Ezekiel and chapter one, we'll again see a glimpse of the glory of God, uh, certainly revealed in this section. Uh, and he sees these four living creatures. And so, for instance, Ezekiel 110, as for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man, the face of a lion, 
on the right side, therefore had the face of an ox on the left side, therefore also had the face of an eagle. Now, what's interesting is that there's a difference here between these in Ezekiel's vision and the ones we're seeing here, the similarities. But the difference is, is in Ezekiel, they all had four faces. All of them had four faces. Now, each of them are, are identical to the man, uh, the lion, the calf, the man, the eagle, but <clears throat> they had four. Whereas here in Revelation, each one has an individual face. So there's a difference there. There's also another difference, and that is to do with their wings. And so verse 11, it says of Ezekiel 1, Thus were their faces and their wings were stretched upward. Two wings of everyone were joined one to another. Two covered their bodies and they went everyone straight forward. And so we have four wings on these in Ezekiel. And we have six wings um, on uh, the beasts that are in the book of Revelation. So there's another distinction. Now, let me give you one more thing. And that's if you look at Ezekiel chapter 10, <clears throat> Ezekiel chapter 10, we get some clarity as to who these creatures are. Um, <clears throat> and they're, they're specifically stated to be cherubims or cherubims more literally and so it will just break in um it says in verse uh two uh, verse three now the, the the cherubim stood on the right side of the house when the man went in and the cloud uh filled the inner court and it describes uh, these cherubims and there uh, it says um <clears throat> what they they were like and, and so he's got a description of them uh and one of the things that's slightly different about them is when we look in chapter 10 um it, it just gives one slight change uh to the cherubim that we saw um at the beginning of chapter one and um the the change if you look at verse 14 uh, of chapter 10 it says everyone had four faces the first was the face of a cherub. The second face was the face of a man. The third, the face of a lion. The fourth, the face of an eagle. And what's changed is instead of the face of an ox, which is in chapter one, now he sees the face of a cherub. So notice that, please. Uh, everyone had four faces. The first was the face of a cherub. The second face of a man. Third, the face of a lion. Fourth, the face of an eagle. And so, of course, that raises a bit of an issue and a question. And the question is simply this. Um, that kind of spoils the whole picture. We've been saying this is a picture of the four views of Christ. And now, all of a sudden, the gospel of Mark is missing. The ox is missing. But I believe what it's telling us is this. And it's a beautiful lesson. And that is this, that the perfect servant's work did not end on the earth. You see, angels, and of course the cherubim are one of the angelic hosts, uh, different ranks within the angelic hosts, but they are ministering spirits who are sent forth to minister to those that are the heirs of salvation, right? So they're servants. And so what's interesting is, what it's telling us here is, is that the service of the Lord Jesus did not end for humanity when he went to the cross, <laughs> He continues to serve, but now in the heavenly realm. And uh, what does he do? Well, he's our high priest. He's our advocate. Uh, he ever lives to make intercession. He's still serving now. The patient, untiring servant has not stopped serving. Even though his service on earth has been completed, he now serves in a heavenly realm. So I don't think in, in any way it takes away from the truth uh, that is being emphasized of this being a picture of the four views of Christ. In fact, it emphasizes uh, it even further. So these four living creatures. Now, again, in Isaiah chapter six, you you ha have the these creatures that are mentioned also 
that that are often known as seraphim. So let's just look at Isaiah six just for a minute, because we're it's it's something you don't hear a lot of teaching on uh, in assembly life generally is the study of angels <laughs> it's a it's a very interesting subject and and so uh, isaiah 6 verse 2 it says above it stood the seraphim each one had six wings with twain he covered his face with twain he covered his feet with twain he did fly one cried to another and said holy 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 is the lord of hosts the whole earth is full of his glory and so here certainly they the, in revelation they have six wings we see that revelation 4 verse 8 the four beasts had each of them six wings about him they were full of eyes within they rest not day and night saying holy 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 lord god almighty which was and is and is to come so clearly seraphim <laughs> seems to be a more apt description although they do bear some resemblance to the cherubim or cherubim in ezekiel chapter 1 now, what else can we learn here? Now, again, just notice the, the emphasis on the eyes that are mentioned here in connection with them. Look at verse 6, again, of, of Revelation 4. Uh, it says, at the end there, four beasts full of eyes before and behind. <laughs> so in front and behind. And again, that would emphasize to us uh, the thought uh, that... <clears throat> before and behind as past and future in view and you see behind you see what's happened in the past you see in front you see what's coming towards you and so these living creatures have a past and future understanding of the purposes of god all was in their view it was they're always thinking about what god is doing looking back to what he's done in the past looking forward to what he's going to do in the future constant awareness of the purposes of god and isn't it marvelous by the way as we look back and we see god's purposes in the past it's a great thing it's good for our souls to look back and see what he's done in times past but it's also good to look forward to what he is about to do in the future and that's caused part of our thrill in studying the book of revelation we're looking forward to see what god is about to do things that must happen hereafter but these these creatures have a, a real awareness of God's purposes, both in the past and up ahead. They're proclaiming the holiness of God. And then it says, again, just thinking of their activity, verse 9, when these four beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever. And by the way, that's a worthwhile activity for all of us, isn't it? To give glory to the one who sits on the throne that lives forever and to give honor to him and to give thanks to him. And all oh, that we would emulate these living creatures in our daily lives in being quick to give honor and glory and thanks to him that sits on the throne who lives forever and ever. And then it says this, the four and 20 elders, we said that they are representing the church. Uh, they fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that lives forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things for thy pleasure. They are and were created. So this is worship concerning God as creator, primarily in view. When we get to chapter 5, uh, and we'll get there this morning, we're going to see worship concerning redemption. But now it's worshiping God as creator. And of course, it's good to worship God as creator. Yesterday, when I was at Bouchard Gardens and seeing the magnificence of the of flowers all in bloom and the beauty of it all, it's not difficult to worship God as creator. And just to see the infinite variety of the things that he has made uh, is just incredible and the detail and you look at i took some great pictures of some of these uh, these flowers and just as you get close up all the intricacy of the detail is just incredible and and to think that the one who sits on the throne all of these things were conceived in his mind he had the intelligence to think about them he made them and there they are and there and, and again he could have made everything black and white if he wanted to 
but everything reflects his glory. And so it's good, isn't it, to worship him that lives forever and certainly to give glory and honor to him. And then it says, thou art worthy, verse 11, to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things. And then here's, here's really, I think, a marvelous punchline. It says this, and for thy pleasure, they are and were created. You see, it's not all about us. <laughs> it's all about him. For your pleasure, for thy pleasure, they are and were created. And of course, that includes us. We were made with the express purpose of bringing pleasure to the heart of God. And of course, since sin entered into the world, often our motivation is not how can I please God or bring pleasure to his heart? It's how can I please myself? And self-centeredness and sin has crept in and man's whole existence seems to be, uh, how can I please myself? And yet when we're redeemed, we realize our true purpose. Our true purpose is to bring pleasure to the heart of God. And what a wonderful thing it is to start our day. Lord, how can I bring pleasure to your heart today? What can I do that would bring a, a smile, as it were, to the throne sitter today that would bring pleasure to your heart? And we have to ask ourselves, is that, is that what's going on? Are we bringing pleasure to the heart of God? Is our conduct, our speech, is it bringing pleasure to the heart of God? Are we those that are constantly thanking him, uh, glorifying him, honor, honoring him, giving him thanks? Is that what we're doing? Now we move into chapter five. And just as chapter four, remember we said chapter four, kind of two dominant ideas. We had the trumpet and the throne. And they just stand out there because of the repetition of words. Uh, the trumpet starts us out. And then from there, we, we're, we're called up to look and we see the throne and that dominates from then on. Well, chapter five is just the same. There's two dominant ideas. Now, there's lots of other things going on, but two dominant ideas. And we get that through the repetition of the words. What the dominant ideas is a book, first of all, and then secondly, a lamb, <laughs> a book and a lamb. Those are the dominant ideas. And we, we want to see that very clearly. Now, I just want to say this. We, we mentioned it before, but it needs to be said again. Chapters four and five are really one vision, right? The chapter and verses, we're glad they're there, but they weren't part of the original document. And really, this is one, one vision, and they should be taken together. Uh, the chapter break is not inspired, and it does, in this case, break up the flow of the vision. So the two chapters provide the background in heaven for the unfolding drama of the events on earth during the tribulation period. So uh, for many years, when I read Revelation, I just thought it was this kind of happy worship scene before we get down to the real business on earth. I have now come to realize that this is key to everything that goes on afterwards in the book of Revelation. In fact, if you don't get chapter four and five, the rest of the book will not make sense at all. So the book is mentioned eight times. Now, of course, it's more literally a scroll. And the reason we say that is books as we know them had not been invented in AD 95. Everything was written on scrolls. And of course, these scrolls were were kind of rolled up like this, and they, you would unfold them, and you would read the contents. And so everything was written on scrolls, parchment scrolls mainly. And so this is really, uh, it's mentioned as a book here, but it's, it's, a, it's a scroll. It's mentioned eight times. And then, of course, the lamb is mentioned five times. And again, we want to just emphasize that actually the word, the literal word for lamb here is the word little lamb. <laughs> scroll and the little lamb so we want to think about those things as we proceed through this chapter and so it says in in verse one and i saw now again this is the first time of of three references to john saying and i saw in this chapter so we get it in verse one i saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And then verse two, and I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice. And then verse 11, and I beheld, it's the same word in the Greek, and I beheld and heard the voice of many angels. 
And so three things that John sees that he wants to kind of bring to our attention. And here's the first one. And so it says, I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne, a book written within and on the, the backside sealed with seven seals. So again, we're just going to use that illustration. And, and the, the picture is that it's being held out on the, the hand of him. And it's, it's sealed along the edge with seven seals. And it's, it's on offer. This document is being held on offer by the throne sitter. So we've got to try and figure out what is this particular document? I saw on the right hand of him a hand outstretched with a scroll upon it, offering it to whoever is worthy to take it. And so, of course, big question. What does this mean? What is this seven sealed scroll? And to find that out, again, remember we said the best way to understand Revelation is to, to see these things elsewhere in Scripture. Let Scripture interpret Scripture. Uh, the, what they call the analogy of faith. Let's look and see what it says elsewhere. And so we go back to Jeremiah now, and I think we get a huge clue as to what's going on in this heavenly vision. And so Jeremiah 32. Jeremiah 32, and we'll break in in verse 6. It says, Jeremiah said, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Behold, Hanameel, the son of Shalem, thine uncle, shall come unto thee, saying, Buy thee my field that is in Anathoth, for the right of redemption is thine to buy it. So Hanameel, my uncle's son, came to me in the court of the prison, according to the word of the Lord, and said unto me, Buy my field, I pray thee, that is in Anathoth, which is in the country of Benjamin, for the right of inheritance is thine, and the redemption is thine. Buy it for thyself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord, and I bought the field of Hanameel, my uncle's son, that was in Anathoth, and weighed him the money, even 17 shekels of silver, and I subscribed the evidence and sealed it and took witnesses and weighed him the money in the balances. So I took the evidence of the purchase, purchase both that which was sealed according to the law and custom and that which was open okay so let's just we'll stop there we could go on and read and, and i would recommend you read the rest of the chapter uh, but you, you're going to get the picture here so so here's his jeremiah now his whole message is this we're going to be kicked out of the land we're going to be gone for 70 years and yet somebody comes and offers him land uh, he has the right to redeem it right he, he can uh he he can be the redeemer of that land it's it's kind of uh just looks like we have in the book of ruth and we've considered that so he he has that opportunity to do it and of course you think well why would anybody buy land when you're going to be kicked out for 70 years and the thought is this we're coming back again uh, after 70 years we'll come back so I, I want to have that land and i want to have it for my uh for my inheritance and for my future inheritance and so when he gets the land the proof of the purchase is that he has two documents one is sealed and the other one is unsealed the sealed one is the official document the unsealed is a copy <laughs> and so it's like if you pay your mortgage off you know you get the you get the original document and then you'd have copies of it <laughs> and so uh, it's your title deed it's showing you own that piece of real estate the sealed one is the one that is um, is the official document, and then there's a copy. And so historians tell us that under Roman law, a will or land deed had to be sealed with seven seals. And these seals, they, you know, it was a, a little kind of blob of wax, and then they would have some kind of signet that they would push into it, and it would kind of make it an official document so the scrolls were sealed with wax blobs impressed with a signet ring to protect the contents or guarantee the integrity of the writing only the owner could open the seals and disclose the contents original documents were usually sealed copies were not sealed documents were kept hidden while unsealed copies were made public usually you'd keep the official document in a very safe place a hidden place so that nobody can steal it and so uh, so this seal scroll couldn't be opened until the seals were broken if the owner chose to do that uh, 
The open copy would declare the rightful ownership, but only an authorized hand could open the sealed copy and allow Jeremiah to enjoy the inheritance for which he had paid the price so long before. Now we've said God's purpose from the very beginning was that man should reign on the earth. Look at Psalm 115. Again, just another evidence of God's plan, God's purpose for man. Psalm 115 and verse 16, we read this. Psalm 115, verse 16, the heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth hath he given to the children of men. So man has been given the earth. It's his area, realm, dominion. Now, when Adam, who was the original region of the earth, right, the one who was originally given dominion, but when he fell, he forfeited the right to ownership when he sinned. In fact, it became the usurpers. And so that's why when Satan comes and he says to the Lord Jesus uh, in the gospel accounts, uh, I think is it Mark's gospel where it says he showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And he said, all this can be yours <laughs> if you simply bow down and worship me. Somehow, he now seemed to have dominion. He's the prince of the power of the air. He seemed to have dominion over it because Adam lost it. But it has now been bought back by the kinsman redeemer. The Lord Jesus bought it back at Calvary. And so for all who wish to see the real ownership of the earth, the, the evidence is found in the word of God. It's an open book. But the sealed document is still in heaven on the right hand of him that sits on the throne. <laughs> so this is the open, this is the copy down here. We know from God's word who's got the right to reign. But the actual the real document, the original document, is the hand of the one that sits on the throne. And so for that document to be opened, the question is asked, who is worthy to do this? And again, I want to suggest to you, again, let's go back to Psalm 2. Psalm 2 anticipates the moment in Revelation 5. <clears throat> Notice verse 6. Yet have I set my king, Psalm 2 verse 6, yet have I set my king on my holy hill of Zion. The idea is this. It's so certain that Jesus is going to reign. And he's going to reign from that holy hill of Zion. So God says, I've set my king. No matter what man says, the heathen raging, the people imagine a vain thing, the kings of the earth setting themselves against uh, together against the Lord his anointed. It doesn't matter how much they raise and how much uh, opposition. God says, I've set my king on my holy hill. When is it going to happen? <laughs> it says, um, I will declare the decree the Lord have said to me, verse 7, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Clearly from Acts 13, that's speaking of resurrection. And then it says, ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. I'll give you the heathen for your inheritance, the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. And so here's the question. The Lord, this is not some kind of missionary prayer. It's often been used that way, right? <laughs> ask the heathen, ask for the heathen and, and all the rest of it. But, but really, it's not a missionary prayer. God is saying to his son, whenever you ask, it's yours. <laughs> you can have the heathen for your inheritance, the uttermost parts of the earth for your possession. In other words, I'm going to give it to you. You're going to reign on Mount Zion over the entire earth. And all you have to do is ask, and it's yours. Well, up to now, he hasn't asked. He's bought it. He's redeemed it. But he hasn't asked for it. And so it's now being offered in Revelation 5. Again, we'd say after the church age has run its path, the churches have ended, the trumpet sounded, the church is caught up, and then this event takes place. The sealed scroll is in the hand of the one who sits on the throne, who is worthy to take it. The title deeds of the purchased possession, the earth, 
is now on offer. But can anybody be found worthy to take the book and open the scrolls? And the reason why we, we want somebody who's worthy is somebody who's up to the task, somebody who's fit to reign over the entire world. Because the first Adam obviously wasn't fit. <laughs> he failed miserably. We don't want another failure. Is there anybody out there that's up to the task? Is there anybody worthy of this, this responsibility that could actually rule and reign over planet Earth for God and do it right? Is there anyone that could possibly do that? And so it says, verse 2, I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. And, and verse 3 gives us a, a glimpse here. By the way, this strong angel is the first of three mentions of a strong angel. Maybe we'll just mention that before we look further. Look at chapter 10, verse 1, where we get a second glimpse. And this is at the middle point of the tribulation period. I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud and a rainbow was upon his head. So again, that's the idea of this strong angel, this mighty angel, same idea. Chapter 18, when we get towards the end of the tribulation period and the destruction of Babylon, 18 verse 1, after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. So three mighty angels, and each of them signaling. Here, we've got the beginning of the tribulation is about to happen. We've got a mighty angel revealed. The midpoint, chapter 10 verse 1, another mighty angel and then as we come to a climax of the tribulation, we have a third mighty angel that will announce the crash of Babylon as we reach the close of the tribulation. So he, he says, strong angel proclaiming, who is worthy? And verse 3 gives us a, a glimpse of the depravity of the human race. No man in heaven, nor in earth, neither under the earth. In other words, no one living or no one that has died in the past. Not one of them is really up to this task. Neither under earth was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. Nobody's fit for the task at all. And so, notice it, it says... Um, John's response is, I wept much. Now, again, we see a lot of weeping in scripture on earth. <laughs> this is a veil of tears. But we don't, it's kind of startling. Here's a man in heaven. Remember, he's caught up to heaven and he's weeping. And part of the reason is, John recognized if nobody's found that's worthy, then we, we still have the usurper doing his thing, right? We need somebody to take over from this usurper who's already been defeated at the cross, but he's still kind of roaming around and we're going to be left in that condition. But we get this picture of the wretchedness of the human race. No one's up to the task. It seems hopeless. Not one person fit to take dominion. And John weeps. And it's a strong word. It really is. It's, a, uh, it's audible weeping, sobbing of a broken spirit. Same verb is used to describe Christ weeping over Jerusalem in Luke 19, verse 4. Uh, and again, tears are peculiar to the earth. And to see a man weeping in heaven is startling. No one found in any of these places who is worthy to take it. And so then one of the elders, verse 5, said to me, weep not. Stop crying, John. Behold, get a look. Here's the worthy one. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. He has prevailed. Another way you could say this is, Behold, triumphed, conquered the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. Here's the one who has 
conquered, the one who has triumphed. And of course, it must have in view the triumph of the cross. He is triumphed. He has bought back this earth and he is fit for the task. He's worthy. Uh, and part of his testing uh, in the wilderness was, uh, is he up for the task? Is, is, he, is he the one who is fit to reign on this earth? How is he going to do with the usurper? Uh, the first man, Adam, he was tested right in a perfect garden. Here's now uh, this this one who is coming to say that he is the rightful throne sitter, the one who's going to reign, and he's tested, and he triumphs gloriously. And so the one who has overcome. And so notice verse 6, he says, and behold, and lo. And I, that's the, the word lo there is kind of an element of surprise. Because, you see, one of the elders says, it's the lion of the tribe of Judah, and then he says, and I beheld, verse 6, and lo, in the midst of the throne of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth to all the earth. And the shock is this. He's told to look at the lion, and then he sees a little lamb. <laughs> it, that's kind of a bit of a shock, right? You've got this vision of seeing this mighty lion, and then he looks and he sees a little lamb. Now, let's just think a little bit of this reference to Judah. I want us to go back to uh, the book of Genesis, chapter 49. Genesis 49, and we'll begin in verse 8. It says, Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise, because Judah means praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. So he's going to destroy all his enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. All Israel are going to bow down to the one from Judah. Judah is a lion's whelp. There's where we get the lion of the tribe of Judah. From the, the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he couched up a lion as an old lion. Who shall rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. And so, again, what a beautiful picture, the lion of the tribe of Judah. But it says, in surprise, he sees a lamb. And it's interesting that this lamb, it's the, the, the word is, is unique. It's a little lamb. In fact, it's interesting that uh, we mentioned this. Uh, it, it, the word lamb is used 29 times in this book. Um, and only uh, in the rest of the New Testament, it's only used once. And it's only used in John 21 and verse 15, where Peter is commissioned and he's told, feed my little lambs. But the, the other word for lamb that's used in the rest of the New Testament is a completely different word. And it has the idea of a sacrificial lamb. And so, behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. That's a sacrificial lamb. That's the word that's used there. Uh, and so it's used elsewhere, different word. Here it's a little lamb. And, and the thought is this. The sacrifice is over. <laughs> it's, it's not a sacrificial lamb anymore. But it's a little lamb. But it's, the evidence is that it once was sacrificed. Because he says, I... Uh, uh, verse 6, I beheld, lo, in the midst of the throne, one of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, this little lamb, as it had been slain. So there's evidence that it died, <laughs> that it had been sacrificed, that it had been slain. But notice, it says, as it had been slain, uh, sorry, as stood a lamb, as it had been slain. So it's it's not dead now it's not laying down now a slain lamb but it stood up again and so you got there not just the fact that christ died but he rose again there stood a lamb as it had been slain there's there's this evidence and by the way uh, as it had been slain is the idea it's like it just happened it's like it's just fresh but now it's standing and so the thought is, it's clear the sacrifice is over. The same lamb now is about to walk up to the throne and receive the title deeds to planet Earth. 
died. He's risen. <laughs> He's standing. And so this, this little lamb, freshly slain, and by the way, isn't it wonderful that in glory, we will never, ever lose the freshness of Calvary. <laughs> That's good. Is that God doesn't ever want us to forget. Like the only reason we're going to be there is because of the work of the Lamb. And we'll, we'll never be allowed to forget his work, his great work on Calvary. So this little Lamb, but he's risen. He's standing. Yes, he was slain, but he's standing. Oh, how wonderful that is. And then it tells us, uh, having seven horns. Now, of course, we know in Scripture that a horn symbolizes power. And seven horns symbolizes absolute power, total, complete power. Uh, the one who is this lamb is all powerful. And then seven eyes, again, gives the idea of complete vision, <laughs> which are the seven spirits of God. And so, again, we've just mentioned that uh, the Lord Jesus, the Lamb, all his labors, all his ministry was done in the absolute, complete dependence upon the Spirit of God. Uh, he, he was the anointed one. He was the one that came in. The very word Messiah has the idea of the anointed, the anointing oil, which symbolizes the Spirit. And so here's one that that's all-powerful, that's all-knowing, has absolute clear vision. How about that for qualifications for taking the scroll would you think he'd be up to the task i mean he, he he's got all power and and he's got all knowledge all wisdom all vision he's perfect for the task and that's what it's telling us there's no one more perfect for the task than this lamb and so verse seven it says he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne now we, we can't let this slip by you know sometimes you read these things and you just read it, and you don't think about it. But remember that to walk up to him that sits on the throne, there's these four living creatures. And their job is to defend the holiness of God, just like in the garden. You remember there was the, the cherubim there with the shining sword. And you just couldn't walk up into the presence of God. <laughs> and yet, here's this one, and he walks right up to the one sitting on the throne, Past the living creatures, past the myriads of angels, he walks right up and he, he takes the scroll out of the hand of the one that is on the throne. He came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of orders, which are the prayers of saints. Now, I want to just just to get this. This is just marvelous. They all fall down and acknowledge the lamb. It's wonderful. The four beasts, 24 elves, fell down before the lamb. And they, <clears throat> they've they got harps, of course, which would speak a song. And there's, they're going to sing a new song, verse 9. But they also, it says, they've got these golden bowls full of odors or full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Now, just think about this. See, the prayers of the saints through the ages. One of the prayers of the saints has been the one that the Lord taught his disciples to pray. And what did that say? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And, and now it's almost like all those prayers that have gone in through the centuries about to be answered. Now, God's answered many, many prayers, and we're, we're, we can all testify to that. But there's some prayers that have been prayed a long time and they haven't been fulfilled yet. And now these prayers are going to meet their fulfillment. Uh, the, the prayers of, of those that, that are going to be suffering during the tribulation period and how long, O oh Lord, uh, faithful and just before you deal with these people, those prayers are going to be answered. These prayers, and by the way, doesn't that, isn't this an encouragement to pray? Those prayers are not lost. Here they are in golden bowls, and they're poured out before the throne, which are the prayers of saints. What that tells us is our prayers, when we're praying our, how we should, you know, again, if, we're, if, I, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord's not going to hear me. But if I'm in a right condition to pray, those prayers, they're, they're treasured up 
before the very throne of God. And they're going to be answered. And, and what a wonderful thing. The prayer of many through the centuries, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, is about to be fulfilled. And what a marvelous thing it is. And they sung a new song, verse 9, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nations. <clears throat> now the worship is not so much creation in view, but redemption. You're worthy because you've redeemed us to God by your blood. Now, just one quick comment because our time has, has escaped us again. But I just want to say this, that when, when the Lamb opens the seals, there will be a corresponding action on the earth. And so the first seal will be opened, and then you're going to see something happen on the earth. Second seal, all the way through the seven seals. And, and so what's going to happen is this. I want you to imagine... Now, here I am in beautiful Victoria, British Columbia, and there's some marvelous real estate here. So imagine that I find out that I have a long lost relative that actually owns a great, massive mansion here in British Columbia, in Victoria, and they, they've left it to me. And so I have to go and get the, the official documents but once I get the official documents, I realize there's a bunch of hippies that are squatting on my residence and they don't want to leave. <laughs> they think it belongs to them. And they've been squatting in that place for a long time. Before I can enter in and take my inheritance, I've got to get the squatters removed. Now, the book of Revelation, the Lord Jesus has been given the title deed. But there's a bunch of squatters down here. They're called earth dwellers. And they think this earth belongs to them. And they say, we will not have this man to reign over us. They said it once before. They're still saying it. They haven't changed their minds. So before he can take his inheritance, the squatters have to be removed. In the book of Revelation, God is going to, when the seals are opened, he is going to systematically remove the squatters to get the earth ready for his son to take up his residence. And that, in a nutshell, is the book of Revelation. That's what it's. That's why I say it. this chapter is so critical. He's got the title deeds, but there's still these people here, the earth dwellers, they think it belongs to them. It doesn't belong to them. It belongs to him. And so he has to remove all opposition. And chapter 6 through 19 is how he removes all opposition. And then he comes and he reigns in righteousness for a thousand years. May God encourage us with this marvelous prospect as we look forward. Amen.